Hello learners and welcome to the second live event of SC1X Supply Chain Fundamentals. I'm Ima Borrella. I'm a postdoctoral associate here at the Center for Transportation and Logistics at MIT. And I am the course lead of SC1X, as you already know. And I'm really happy to be here today with Dr. Larry Lapidi. Hi, Larry. Hi, Emma. Hi. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Larry is an expert in forecasting and is an OP. And I would like to uh, briefly introduce, introduce his bio because it's a very long and interesting bio. So I'll try to do my best to summarize all his achievements. He holds a PhD in operations research from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School. He's an electrical engineer with a master's from MIT. And uh, he currently works as a lecturer at the University of Massachusetts. He's also a research affiliate here at CTL in MIT. And uh, in, he led a really interesting project, Supply Chain 2020, that focused on understanding the future of supply chain management and led the demand management research group at MIT. His experience in business is also very wide. Uh, he has more than 30 years of experience in supply chain and marketing, experience in consulting, um, in the high tech sector, and also as a market analyst. Um, and he's been uh, teaching while he was also working in, in business on a part-time basis. He, he's been part uh, and held several professional society officer positions, including a few years serving as a board member and treasurer of the Supply Chain Council, president of the Boston chapter of the Institute of Management Scientist, Sciences, sorry, now in forms. Mm -hmm. And um, most importantly, he got a great award is the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement in Business Forecasting and Planning Award, bestowed by the Institute of Business Forecasting and Planning in 2012. Congratulations for that. And he has written numerous articles, including writing an ongoing column in the Journal of Business Forecasting since 1997, and Supply Chain Management Review since 2008. So, Great bio, so thank you so much for being here, Larry. I'm sure we're gonna learn a lot from, from you today. And uh, the agenda for today's live event is the following. First, we will discuss a little bit about forecasting in a business environment, because you've learned a lot about forecasting, but uh, Larry will uh, share with us his insights on how it is like, to develop a forecasting function in a company. Uh, then he will introduce, uh, he will explain why he wrote the article we will discuss today is this article don't just measures don't just measure forecast errors but use them I guess yes. uh, so he will introduce the article after that we will go to the breakout to the breakout sessions where you can discuss with your peers about two questions we will propose you uh, after the discussion rooms we will come back here and uh, we will discuss with dr. Lapidi on these two questions and also uh, you will share your insights with us so we can comment with you um, and after that we will wrap up and close the live event so um, Larry uh, the floor is yours so. okay thank you Inma. nice introduction um, I'm just gonna put my glasses on because I may have to read some of my some of my notes but uh, I'm glad thank you very much for having me here uh, I'm talking about a topic I been dealing with for over 30 years. Uh, it's business forecasting. When we when we go to school, when I went to school, we learned about forecasting, but it was all about statistical methods, and that's th those are very important. Uh, but in a business environment, you also have to worry about the process of forecasting. You know, so if you look at forecasting, it's a business process. It's got to be done. It's got to be done routinely, and it's got to be done. I believe by a very professional business uh, business forecasting organization focused on forecasting, all right? So we're gonna talk first a little bit about forecasting in the business environment. And over the last 30 years, the big trend has been into something called one number forecasting. One number forecasting does not mean there's just one number. What it means is one set of numbers that the whole organization is planning on around. So we have to know what's going on in the future uh, in terms of revenue. That's the thing that drives all the operations in business. So the marketing people have to plan in their area for the revenue we're expecting to get and, and create and shape. The salespeople as well. 
Supply chain, we have to get all the supply chain resources in place in time to meet customer demand. The finance people have to worry, do we meet our financial uh, performance targets? So everyone is interested in that the, uh, business forecast, which says how much business are we going to get from customers? What is going to be the revenue? Because we're trying to get to one number, accountability and commitment from everyone, that that's the set of numbers that are going to be the revenue numbers, and then the people are going to plan around it to make sure we meet the profitability targets as well over time. Okay, so that's kind of what we mean by one number, one number forecasting. Now, what does a forecaster do? Well, basically, we build models and we quantify. That's what we do. We quantify it. We take all the marketing and sales activities and plans going forward, maybe six months to 18 months out, and we look at what's going on it has gone on in the business historically and then we look at potentially what might happen in the future competitively and to the uh, business environment and we develop a set of models that quantify the numbers and what we normally are working on numbers that drive the rest of the organization and we'll talk a bit about that when we talk about the pyramid so that is really what we're doing but if you remember the people who are responsible for creating and shaping demand in a company is marketing and sales. So a key thing is to work very well with the marketing sales organization to understand what they're trying to do to impact the future for, for revenues uh, themselves. And the key thing is also we are looking at unconstrained demand because we don't want to get, we want to meet unconstrained demand and we don't want supply to constrain that. So we can't achieve revenue targets because supply doesn't have it. That's why it's important that supply chain also take the revenue forecast and use it to create their, their supply plans going forward for the next six months to 18 months out. And if you look at it from a forecaster, what's another thing we do? Uh, you know, I always talk about the thing we were and look at in the past is variation in demand. Uh, and the reason why we look at variation in demand is because if, simply put, if demand did not vary, there'd be no reason to have a forecaster. And the forecasters are important because we have to understand what impacts the business and why those demand variations have happened in the past so we can also explain what are the variations in the future that might happen, okay? Uh, so that's what it's all about. Um, now, the thing that I like to talk about is the pyramid, and we're gonna pop that up right now. Do you wanna pop up that pyramid? Okay. You have to get buy-in for your forecast. Uh, you have to basically, okay, do we have it yet? No, you got us. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Technical problems. Um, share. Okay. So these are a set of uh, forecasting plan hierarchies. I think they're the most important thing to be doing anytime you're build, uh, developing a forecasting and or sales and operations planning process, which we won't talk much about today. But these are the hierarchies you have to create. And I describe it like you have to take the forecast and even the plans when we talk, if you were to talk about that, and you have to put it in multiple language. What are those languages? People in the company talk different languages. So if you like, a, take a look at the, uh, the le left-hand side of this pyramid, the pyramid called demand side views. How do people talk about the business in that area? So if you look at sales, many companies make mistakes and try to get the sales organization to agree to unit-based forecast. How many of an SKU am I going to sell? They really can't do it that way. They don't think that way. They think in terms of how much they sell to each account in dollars in the US, of course. In other countries, it's whatever currency you have. So when you talk to sales and you try to take your forecast and roll it up to them, this is all about aggregating the data. And we're aggregating the data to their language. And their language deals with dollars, money. Uh, which is really revenue, and they want to see it by accounts. Maybe they don't want to see it by every account, but maybe they want to see it by their major accounts, right? And then they can look at it and say, well, you're forecasting this for Walmart, and we don't think Walmart's going to do that. We think Walmart's going to do less than that. Or So they, they can respond to it when you present the forecast for Walmart. Then also by regions. So the U.S. rolls it up. You roll up to the U.S. level. You roll up to uh, Europe. You roll it up to Asia Pacific. And they have to look at it and say, you know, that looks okay from a dollar perspective in terms of what we can sell. So you're in the language of sales. 
Uh, and that's the language. And then obviously it's at the company level. So basically the view as we aggregate the data from the lowest level has to be that view to them. And I always say to salespeople, speak Greek because we have an expression in the United States. If you speak Greek, nobody understands you. And unfortunately in many companies, the sales organization has their own unique uh, identity and uh, not, not everybody on the supply side <laughs> really communicates well with them. But that's a different story. Okay, now, how about the marketing people? Okay, marketing, I was a marketing person, so I, I know how marketing people think. And they think in terms of, uh, they can think in terms of dollars and units as well. They don't have to think just dollars, they also think of units. Uh, they wanna see things by brand. Uh, and so if you show a brand manager at a company what the revenue uh, forecast is and they look at it and they say, yes, that's what I was expecting from my brand, I can be, I can commit and be accountable for making sure we generate that revenue in that brand. And each brand manager would want to look at it and make sure that they're comfortable with the revenue target. You roll it up even further, brands are, uh, are in groups, and so you get groups, and uh, basically you roll it up to product groups, and again, the pro person responsible for the product group also wants to see it and see whether or not they can be accountable and they commit to making that revenue number and then you go to company. So that is the market view. That's the demand side view. Now we go to the, the middle one, which is the view we all love, supply chain, right? What are supply chain people? How do we think, okay? So if you take a look at logistics, we, we talk about units and cases. We very rarely talk about revenue. We wanna see the forecast in terms of units and cases because we can do something, something about that. So we wanna know something about the geographies. Where are the ship to locations? How much are we gonna to ship to the West Coast? Or how much are we gonna to ship to the East Coast of the United States? Maybe how much we're gonna ship out of Asia, uh, Latin America. Uh, so the ship to location view is some view that we can then feed the transportation people. Do we have enough transportation capacity to, to achieve that? Uh, then we roll it to warehouses. How much revenue is going to have to uh, be sent out from the warehouse? We don't care about revenue, but we care about cases and units. How much is going to get sent out? And does this forecast make sense? Do we even have capacity to do it? Do we have the capacity to receive materials and product? Do we have capacity to load and ship it out? So they want to see it by warehouse and they can say, okay, are we have enough warehouse uh, uh, operation capacity or they don't, right? So that's the uh, logistics view. And then the manufacturing view, they have production lines. You know, is this revenue forecast? And again, in terms of uh, units, is this revenue forecasting meaning that the uh, we're using 80% uh, capacity of the line? That might be okay. You know, it's all right. But if you're going to put 150% on a production line, uh, I'd only agree to it if I get overtime where I could do another shift. All right. So basically, the manufacturing people have to be comfortable that we can produce what the revenue forecast says, and it's all in terms of uh, units. Okay, so that's the middle one. Those are the good guys, remember, because we're supply chain. Now we go to finance. Uh, we got two views of finance. One is the budgetary units. In other words, the, the finance people are responsible for budgets. Budget is nothing more than an allocation of resources. We do once a year. And we do it, and we uh, they want to look at revenues and margins and say, okay, what are the margins and the revenues that are going to result from this forecast? I want to see it by operating unit to see whether or not we've got adequate resources to support it. I want to see it by divisions and business units and to make sure we're supporting the divisions in that way. And then, of course, we want to see it by weeks, quarters, and years because I want to see if we're going to meet financial targets. You know, normally we're on a annual uh, performance targets for finance. And so we wanna make sure that the forecast is consistent with what we're trying to achieve from a performance perspective. Okay, so that's the, that's the hierarchies. And the last thing I wanna talk about is the models themselves, okay? How do you make these models that people will believe in? Okay, because now you've got the, you know, the looks, but how did you get this numbers? How do, if I don't agree with it, how do you convince me as a marketing person, a salesperson or a financial person that it's a good forecast, okay? And here's what, what you gotta do. You gotta do, first of all, a, uh, uh, the models have to look reasonable. I know when we're all in school, we learn very fancy mathematical equations and stuff like that. That doesn't fly in business. It has to be understandable by somebody. Even if it's a complex formula, it's still gotta be reasonably understandable in terms of what you're doing. So it, it has to have what I call face validity as well, as well as validity. 
And so validity is accuracy. Base validity is looks reasonable. Okay. So that's the one thing about that. You also have to build it up. You have to build up what we call base business first. Term business, that's typically a statistical forecast, which takes the history and moves it forward, but de-promotes the data, gets all the promotions out and the new product sales out and basically gives us a good history, a good historical and to project from. Okay, so we, we have what's called base or turn business. On top of that, we add on business we're going to get from promotions that get run by marketing and sales. On top of that, we're going to produce new products that we're going to be putting bringing into market. We got to put on top of that, and then we have to bring in some market intelligence, which is market intelligence from people in marketing and sales to tell us what's going on out in the business. Okay, so that's a you build it up in four ways. Now, so that's a good thing because then you can tell people and, and make it clear what's going on on in the pyramids. Second piece of this is you want to uh, basically. Uh, focus on facts, figures, and assumptions. Now, what do I mean by that? Typically, you've got to get buy-in and commitment and accountability from all the organizations. Let's say the salesperson says, I don't believe that number. I want you to change it. I'm not changing the number. Why? Because what I'm going to explain to you is what the facts, figures, and assumptions I got to get to it. Those facts, figures, and assumptions led to a number because I have a model to get to the number. So if you wanted to dispute the number, you have to dispute either the facts are wrong, the assumptions are wrong, or the figures are wrong. If you can't say they're wrong, you're not responsible for the model. That was what I do, which is to take those facts, figures, and assumptions and quantify it to a forecast. That's what I get paid to do. The salespeople can respond to it, but then you got if you want to change it, and you have to disagree with one of the facts, figures, and assumptions, or you got to do something different. All right. So that's basically the way you defend it. In, in an organization, and that has to be defended, okay? But not the numbers themselves. Fact figures and assumptions were behind it. Okay, now, so that's the first thing I wanted to talk about was forecasting the business environment. Next, why did I write this article? Uh, basically, it's very simply put. Forecasters are ashamed of their forecast errors. I'll be honest with you. When we've, we've done a lot of benchmarking, business forecasting, you're ashamed of the numbers, 50%. Uh, error on maybe a stock keeping unit and location is not bad. It's actually a good forecast because with all promotions and stuff that get created, it's it's uh, it's not bad. Okay, so essentially, uh, I wrote this article to say you know you got to learn from your errors is one thing, and you also have to be able to pop, tell people what the errors are so they can plan for risk management. Okay, and that's what what. Uh, what is in the article. So I think we're at the stage where you're going to be addressing the two questions mm -hmm. and then we'll talk about it. Okay. Thank you, Larry. That was extremely interesting. I think it's going to be very useful for our learners. Okay. Um, so now we're going to go to the breakout rooms. I hope all of you have read this article. Uh, you can download it from the from the section live events, second live event in the in the course. So if you don't have downloaded it, download it now. And uh, go to the to the breakout rooms. Uh, we will be discussing these two questions. Are you showing them, Arthur? Thank you. So question one is, how might you analyze your forecast errors in order to improve your forecasting? How will you use them to improve your forecasting? And the second question is, in what ways might a company use forecast errors in order to manage risks? So um, is this idea that Dr. Lapidi just uh, Put out, I say you have these errors. Usually, people are ashamed of them, but they're usually they're really, really useful, really valuable. Uh, so, how could you put them in use to improve your forecast and to manage risks? So, please go to the breakout rooms, discuss these two questions, and we will be back here in 15 minutes. <laughs> 